My name is Nick Lutton, and I'm the Family Engagement Program Manager for Family Voices of California. And today we're joined um, by an unbelievable panel. And that panel uh, is going to go ahead and introduce themselves because I don't think that I could do them justice. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about Family Voices of California and what it is that we do so you understand uh, how it is that we operate. So Family Voices of California is a statewide collaborative of parent-run centers working to ensure quality health care for children and youth with special health care needs. We're what's called the Families F to F in the state of California, and there's two of us. Um, our mission uh, is to build the capacity of parent centers throughout California to provide families with information and support they need uh, to make informed decisions about their children's health care. Uh, we provide information and a forum for parent centers um, and family advocates to be able to improve public and private policies, build partnerships between professionals and families, and serve as a vital resource um, on health care. So we cover multiple areas. Uh, California Children's Services, or CCS, is one of them. The whole child model, enhanced care management, project leadership, which is an unbelievable aspect of Family Voices of California. And some of the panelists here are very well familiar with it. Um, and it's family advocacy for health systems improvement and change. And it's unbelievable program. And I highly suggest that you uh, take a look at our website to go ahead and learn more about that. And then our Health Summit and Legislative Day in Sacramento, which is an unbelievable opportunity where we have uh, parents and professionals that we have gone that have gone through project leadership and we take them to the Capitol and they get to meet with their representatives and talk about issues that are important to them and their families, especially all of those with children and youth with special health care needs. And just to be transparent, because we take the parent uh, perspective extremely important, and so do I. Um, I'm a father of two children. I have a 10-year-old with ASD and ID, and then I have a four-year-old uh, with ASD, and both of them are regional center clients. So I'm a father of two children as well. So this topic is extremely uh, important to me. As Nick mentioned, we're going to start off just by introducing uh, each, each, you know, ourselves uh, as panelists here. Um, my name is Steve Ritter. I work at the UC Davis Mind Institute at the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. And uh, as we'll talk about later, uh, supported decision-making has been around in California since uh, 2015, 2016. And I've been involved with different projects uh, continuously since, uh, since 2016. My name is Will Miner. I am an attorney with Disability Rights California. In Disability Rights California, we are California's federally funded and advocacy. Our role in the system is to and advance the rights of disabled Californians. Um, and in my role at DRC, I support the work of our IDD practice group, where we work at the intersection of individual legal representation, public policy, and systems change advocacy to better the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in our state. I'm also a sibling. My brother receives services from California's regional center system. And I also want to just quickly note that um, DRC was one of the co-sponsors of AB 1663, the 2022 bill that we're going to talk about today that pits supported decision-making into California law. And we've been actively involved in implementation efforts through trainings like this and in working in partnership with other people and organizations that advance alternatives to conservatorship in California. My name is Otto Lana. I am 18 years old, a high school senior. And as you can see from this slide, I have got a lot of other things to my credit. The important thing to note for this gathering is I am a disabled person who uses augmentative and alternative communication, A, A, C, to access the world and direct my life. I am not conserved, but I am not alone. I have a strong support network that provides guidance when I request it as I journey on my life's path. Hi everyone, I'm Linda and I'm a professor in medicine and disability studies at UCLA. Um, I've received grants published and taught courses on the autism spectrum and IDD, and I've co-founded a supported employment program at UCLA. 
I served on the boards of Autism Society of LA, Westside Regional Center, and the Achievable Clinic. And I chair a human rights committee for uh, the national organization TASH. Um, my inspiration is that I have family members with ASD, including an adult child. One is in a conservatorship that has been for 18 years, and it has become what I would call a profound learning experience. Let's talk about what supported decision making is. There's a lot of chatter about supported decision making at this moment in time. What is it? Uh, what does it mean for disabled people and their families? What does it mean for people seeking conservatorship? So I want to start by just saying this. Supported decision making, it isn't a new concept. It's probably best described as a new way to label nearly universal human experience, people looking to others for help when making decisions, right? The notion that individuals may benefit from assistance and support when making decisions, it's so universal. We have entire industries and professions uh, to serve that need. We have investment advisors, career counselors, we have life coaches, we have lawyers like me. So how do people make decisions, right? How do you make decisions when you're not familiar with the issue? Your taxes, repairs, home improvement? We seek out support. But if you're looking for a definition with a bit more formality, uh, that's what you see on the screen in front of you. So supported decision-making is um, a practice used by people with disabilities who use supporters to help them understand and communicate their own decisions and decisions and choices. And it's also an alternative to conservatorship that can strengthen the capacity of a person with a disability without the need for court involvement. So supported decision making, it's just kind of a lot of words for the principle of getting help when it's needed, just like we all do. But what's new is the growing recognition that disabled people also benefit from that help. And that help can make the difference about whether they can make decisions for themselves or whether they need to be conserved. And this concept is gaining traction. We're gonna talk about it in a little bit, but there are now around 20 states with supported decision-making laws. And although it's not a new concept, it's really a paradigm shift. It upends what used to be the conventional wisdom that disabled people need to be protected from making poor decisions by having a decision maker appointed for them. And it shifts the assumption that decisions will be made. Uh, it shifts, I'm sorry, it shifts, it shifts, decisions will be made for disabled people to an assumption that decisions will be made by them. I mean, then next we're going to hear from Otto and Linda about why supported decision-making matters. With the ability to communicate and a support network in place, we have the ability to drive our lives. This is such a fundamental right, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We deserve to be happy. We deserve to define what happiness means to us. We are all individuals. We should never settle for one size fits all. Do not get treated into believing conservatorship is the only game in town. Don't believe when someone tells you, this is how everyone does it. When was the last time a one-size-fits-all garment really fit you? I totally support Otto's point. And I wanted to share that um, conservatorship uh, gives the court the power to override family decisions and the individual's decisions the conservatee, to control both the family conservator and the conservatee, and to replace the family conservator with an attorney of the judge's choosing. And these are important things to know because <clears throat> it, it's a myth that conservatorship gives families protective power. Under some circumstances, that might happen, but it actually takes power away from families <clears throat> and in too many cases, it can take the loved one away. And that's because it gives the court power over the family. And, you know, as I've seen a lot of cases and um, observed them firsthand, and as kind of a, a composite, uh, 
an example to get an idea of what that means and why that's the case is that if a mother sought to protect her adult daughter from an uncle she was afraid of, um, the mother would want to conserve her <clears throat> uh, to, as a form of protecting her. It actually can uh, backfire because the uncle could then hire an attorney to get a court order that forces the mother to deliver the daughter into unsupervised visits with her uncle. And if the mother or the daughter refuse to comply, the court can implement actions such as threatening contempt um, to make the uncle the conservator or even prevent the mother from seeing her own daughter. Uh, <clears throat> and that may seem very strange and, and unusual, but um, the basis that can be used is uh, known as alleged alienation. And you think, what's the motive behind such things? And, and this is happening uh, around the nation at this time. And apparently there are financial incentives that get set up by providing such absolute power. And <clears throat> the financial incentive is on the parts of the court appointed attorney that's appointed for the daughter, even if she doesn't need and, and can afford her own attorney, uh, the court uh, insists on appointing their own typically. The court also can appoint a guardian ad litem for the daughter. And there are also attorneys involved for the mother and the uncle, for instance. <clears throat> and um, uh, if, a, if a professional conservator were appointed instead of, so the, the court could also appoint the uncle as conservator, but if there was a professional appointed, they and their attorneys would have further financial incentive to keep the mother in court trying to protect her daughter. So, uh, and the court can order the mother to pay for the professional's fees and legal expenses. And when families go to the press to try to get um, somebody to pay attention to this as a problem, it's not unusual for the conservatee or the conserved to have, or the uh, family to have a gag order placed uh, to prevent them from communicating with the press and to exclude the press and the public from the courtroom. So it, it, in terms of protection, that's essentially a myth. Yeah, I would agree with Minden, and, you know, kind of sum it up to say sometimes conservatorship, people think um, it provides protection, but oftentimes it's a, an illusion of protection, an illusion of control. Um, it gives the control to the courts. I mentioned earlier that around 20 states have supported decision-making laws. Um, here are a few. Interestingly, you can see that Texas was the first state in the country to pass a supported decision-making law. I remember folks saying in California, before we passed our own supported decision-making bill, we're really going to let Texas outpace California when it comes to the civil rights of people with disabilities. Um, it's time for California to pass this law too. Um, the other thing that this slide really underscores is that um, although formal decision, although formal supported decision-making is new to California, um, the supported decision-making laws, uh, they're, they're not new. They're not new. Next slide, please. So we're about to dive into California's new uh, supported decision-making legislation. Um, and before we do, I want to make a couple of high-level points. Uh, the first is that uh, the governor signed this bill into law on in September of 2022. Um, here's a fun fact. It passed through the legislature without a single no vote. And it was sponsored by um, Assembly Member Brian Mainshine. And I want to give the assembly member and his staff really all the credit in the world for working with disability and aging advocates across the state on this legislation. Um, they weren't in this for an easy win. They did this because they believed, assembly Mainshine believed in increasing the agency and autonomy of people with disabilities across our state. And to turn the presentation back over to Steve, who's going to dive into really what this law says and why it all matters. I've joked about this when I've done talks on this uh, using this style in the past, which is that if someone told me that they were going to start off with slides with direct quotes from legislation, 
I would tell them it's a terrible idea. Um, the reason I, so the next uh, uh, roughly 10 slides are in fact uh, direct quotes. And the thing that I encourage people to look at is at the top of the right corner, if you see that legislative seal, that means in fact that this is a direct quote that was pulled from legislation. And I do this for a reason. Um, as Will said, uh, the, the, this bill was one that was written um, with very strong ties with people who have done this work. There's been an entire coalition of people since 2016 that have worked continuously on supported decision making throughout uh, California and families that have been uh, shown how to use this principle. And so what's interesting is when you look at the legislation, um, you will see a unusual tone and an unusual uh, focus on very, very um, atypical kinds of understanding, a deep understanding of what's important to people with disabilities. And, and I'm just going to start with this first one. All adults to the best of their ability and with supports they choose should be able to be informed about and participate in the management of their own affairs. I put a note in there. Um, but that is just a fundamental thing that I think most people would agree with. And, and yet it is something that frankly, many people in our system do not actually implement. And so I appreciate to start that there, that this is the basis of the legislation. This, this is again, a direct quote. An adult with a disability is entitled to have present one or more adults, including supporters in any meeting or discussion or to participate in any written communication, including but not limited to, and then they give specific example individual planning meetings required by state or federal law, service and care planning meetings, such as regional centers meetings or school, discharge planning meetings, meetings with health care providers and individuals who provide residential service or long-term services and support. We know that many people struggle in the area of, of being able to enter a healthcare setting and all the stress and unusual language and procedures. And so it's really important that this law says very clearly that anytime someone is meeting with a healthcare provider, they have the right to people that they choose to be a supporter in that meeting. As And similarly, in any situation with a bank, financial institution, or financial planner, you are guaranteed that you should that you can have a supporter present in in that meeting. And I, if I could add, I just want to mention that that is that right, that very important right, is one of the things that gets take, taken away with conservatorship, depending on who the conservator is. Right. Uh, in a conservatorship situation, it's determined who will be present at that meeting. Um, the, this next piece of, of, of legislation that I want to overview, um, says that like adults without disabilities, adults with disabilities may use a wide range of voluntary supports to help them to understand, make, and communicate their own choices. And these voluntary arrangements should be encouraged and recognized as a valid way for people with disabilities to strengthen their capacity and maintain their autonomy. That people with disabilities, as anybody, can use a wide range of, of, of options. And we'll cover what these things are. But it's really important, again, to, to realize that they saw this need, and again, this was informed by the work of the people who tried to use supported decision making, and sometimes have had people say, "Well, you can't use this tool." Um, so let's look at some of the things that that uh, that that they say. 
And Steve, I, if it's okay, I have one more point to make on that, that slide. Um, sometimes people have looked at this language and said, why do you need a law that says this? <laughs> it's true for everybody, right? And like, do we need an expression like this in our law? What does it mean? Why do you need it? And and to that, I respond, right? When, you know, if if I if I ask for support with decisions in my life, um, whether it's like taxes or things like like repairing things in my home, um, people say that that will, he's prudent. He asks for help. Um, he knows when he needs to ask for help. But just so often, um, when people with disabilities seek assistance for help, need help for things, it's treated as evidence of incapacity. Okay. You know, reasons for why a conservatorship or might be necessary or as a way to take away their rights. So in a perfect world, I don't think we need legislation like this. We shouldn't need it. But in reality, we do. Um, because people all too often view, you know, the need of support um, as evidence of incapacity, when really sometimes it's the opposite. Thank you, Will. As a matter of fact, the legislation at one point makes rights into the legislation. These things are actually previously already allowed. We just needed to spell it out. And so there was actually a piece where they said, this is not new. But by writing it out, we're giving families and people with disabilities the opportunity to show people, I have this right. And, and that's one of the things that so many people have struggled with, is that you, if, if, if someone is telling you you can't do something and you say, well, I can, the person who's in that power situation is the one who's going to make that call. So having this legislation is something that will, and we'll talk about that we are equipping families, but we are also going to be working with these power structures. And so we'll talk a little bit about how that's happening, but we're not asking families to carry this entire burden alone. You will have support with implementing this, this, this tool of supported decision-making. So I like this, this piece of this part of legislation. Uh, supported decision-making is one of several options available to adults with disabilities to understand, make, and communicate decisions, to express preferences, including, but not limited to, the tools of a medical and financial power of attorney, authorized representative forms, health care directives, release of information forms, and representative payees. Again, at this point, I'm just showing you the legislation. Later on, we will cover these tools and how to use these tools. But I just want to make clear that the legislation specifically, it says not that these, as well as other tools that are not specifically listed, but they did want to list these specific tools because they have been, as well said, in the past, sometimes people have refused to allow these tools to be used for a person with disability. It's shocking when you say it in the abstract that those of us who have done this work have actually seen this, and some families who have tried to do this informally have seen this happen. And so again, this is an opportunity this new legislation and the new supports that will come with this legislation is an opportunity for us to make that paradigm shift that Will mentioned earlier. I want to just mention, this is the same slide. The reason I, 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 I highlight this, those, these, these five tools that were mentioned there is that all of these tools that are listed within that legislation are all very different than uh, uh, the support that would be offered by conservatorship in these areas of medical care, um, health care directions, uh, information that families are seeking, and the opportunity to be to stay involved in people's lives. In that, these tools are all voluntary, and they are able to be rescinded at the point that a person doesn't want or to make changes, as well as these are tools that, that provide 
the person with disability and the family the opportunity to say how much support is required. And so these can be all tailored and changed as compared to being imposed and, and a court needing to make any alteration to them. So this is a really important thing for us to understand. Again, going to carry through with just some legislation, and then we'll get to some of the practical application of it. And that this next section of legislation, an adult with a disability may choose to enter into a supported decision making agreement with one or more chosen supporters and support may include but is not limited to helping the adult with a disability under, obtain and understand information related to a life decision, communicating that decision to others, and assisting the individual to ensure their preferences and decisions are honored. I just wanna back up again to mention, these are things we oftentimes as we are expressing our preferences, some of our preferences not being, or our decisions. Some of those decisions may not be the things that other people think are necessarily the best for us. But when we do these things, there is just a natural granting of, if I say it, then people tend to respect and, and they tend to listen and respect those choices. Oftentimes, and I'm I'm talking within the, when, as people talk to the regional center, as they talk to their doctors, as they talk to different people, and again, authority that people need to, to navigate. Oftentimes, I have been in many meetings where a person has made a very clear statement. And that meeting continues as if that statement was never said and never heard. And so having these supporters to make sure again, that the person understands the information and communicates if necessary or amplifies what the person says, clarifies what the person says. And then also to ensure that people actually respect and, and act on those choices or um, that information that was given. This is again, a part of legislation that really shows how well this law was and the people who were writing this law were listening because many people communicate differently. And it, I like the fact that this says an adult with a disability may indicate they wish to have one or more adults attend a meeting or discussion or participate in any written communication through an oral statement, verbalizing, a gesture, which may be something about asking people to come in or um, I'm trying to think of other gestures that people may use as indications. Like trying to open the door, indicating they want a door open. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, or any augmentative or alternative communication method used by the adult with a disability. So there is a very wide open um, um, understanding that we need to accept the communication that the, that the person is able and comfortable with using. And I think Otto has something to say about this. This is such an important distinction. We are all multimodality communicators. There are so many ways to express yourself. The importance of having a support team that understands you and your methods of communication cannot be overemphasized. Communication can look different for individuals, especially in individual situations. I normally type on a waterproof letterboard I designed, shameless plug. For conferences and presentations, I use an elaborate setup of an iPad Pro, a text-to-speech software, and a Bluetooth keyboard. But there are times when a simple choice board is the best way to communicate. When you are waking up from anesthesia is a great example. 
You have an I, V, you are in an unfamiliar, possibly frightening environment, you are most likely disoriented. It is unlikely you will be regulated enough to communicate in a way you normally do. So much of communication is motor planning. And anesthesia definitely affects your motor planning. So I use the choice board with only two choices to keep it the most simple. Choice one, I am fine. Choice two, get my mom. This just takes a little bit of planning and forethought. I am not trying to change the system of practice in the P-A-C-U. This effort of communication will make their lives easier. I also make sure there is clear labeling on my chart that I do not use speech to communicate. This alerts staff, verbal responses are not to be expected for assessing my level of consciousness. They will have to use a different tool to assess if I am aware of person, place, and time. How about a choice board? See how easy it is to think ahead. Thank you, Otto. Um, we are almost done with the legislation, but again, I think it's so important for me not to tell you what I think is in the legislation or my interpretation of what's in the legislation. I think it's important for you to know what's in this legislation. Um, so this, uh, one of the things I appreciate is that there is a very high bar, uh, for in order to say that a person cannot have a supporter in a room. And the legislation specifically says that a third party, a doctor, a service coordinator, a, a teacher, can only refuse the presence of one or more adults, including supporter, if the third party reasonably believes that there is fraud, coercion, abuse, or other actions by the individuals that are requested to be included in the meeting by the person with disability. Um, that so the only reason that they would exclude them is if they had concerns to the level that the third party is required to report that they're concerned about fraud, coercion, or abuse or other action to CPS or one of the other required mandated reporting agencies. That is a very high bar. You can't say, I don't want this person here because I, I, I need to do this. Um, it, there needs to be that level of concern that you are willing to report or that person would be willing to report the supporter that is requested to be there to a, a mandated reporting agency. Um, so this is a really important understanding. And again, it's important for you, but we will also be working with these people who sometimes have made these kinds of things, uh, these types of, of exclusions of support to make sure that they understand this part of the, the, the law. Um, regarding what a supporter will do, uh, they, again, good foresight to think about uh, making sure that we have a clear understanding about the role, the appropriate role of a supporter. And a supporter should do all the following. Support and implement the direction, will, and preferences of the adult of the, uh, with a disability. Respect the values, belief, and preferences of the adult with a disability. Act honestly, diligently, and in good faith. Act within the scope identified with an adult with disability. In clear terms, we should know what the, the person that has asked us to support, we should have a very clear idea of what they want us to support and stay within that area of, that, that is requested. Um, and we should, of course, maintain confidential, confidentiality of any information obtained by the supporter unless the adult with a disability specifically authorizes to disclose that information. So very clear limits on what is appropriate for a supporter to do. On the other side, 
what should a supporter not do? So a supporter shall not coerce an adult with a disability. And unless the supporter has a valid legal authorization to do so, and the action is within the scope of their authority, a supporter shall not do either of the following. Make decisions for or on behalf of the adult with a disability and sign documents on behalf of an adult with a disability. Now, again, we'll talk about it. There are times if we have an advanced care director where the person has said, I would like you to be part of making a decision or in fact, make a decision, then we can do that because we've been authorized to do so by the person with disability. So I don't want this to be read in the abstract and for people to say, well, that means that we can't either uh, we can't make decisions. In some cases, if we have been given the, the authorization to do so, that is, an, and we will show documents that allow people to do that and to assign that ability to a supporter. And Steve, I have just a few more points on supporters, um, if it's okay. Of course. So I sometimes hear a question when we talk about who the supporters can be that goes something like this. So you mean just anyone can be a supporter, anyone at all? And there's this implication that's kind of unsaid, being that, wow, the bar seems really low and there might be some bad actors out there looking to take advantage of someone with a disability. And to that, I usually say or think, um, well, there's any tool in the toolbox can be used by bad actors and that can happen in the conservatorship system it can happen through supported decision making but within the context of ab 1663 this legislation it also included some pretty important safeguards about who can be a supporter and the obligation of those supporters so there are some laws that say that supporters are bound by all existing laws designed to protect people with disabilities from fraud, abuse, neglect, coercion, and mistreatment. So one of those laws that immediately comes to mind is the Elder Abuse and Dependent Adult Civil Protection Act. So anyone that's a supporter has to abide by those laws. Another safeguard that's in the legislation is that a supporter can't participate in any life decision where there could be a conflict of interest. For example, there would be a conflict of interest if a supporter supports someone to create a will where the supporter is then a beneficiary of that will. There's a conflict there. Um, a supporter wouldn't be able to support in those circumstances. And the law, and we, we maybe need to create another slide on this, um, includes five situations where an individual is prohibited from being a supporter. Um, so it includes uh, situations where someone has been subject to an allegation under our abuse protection laws, where the adult decision maker with a disability has obtained a uh, um, order of protection from abuse against the supporter. Um, if the supporter was previously a conservator who was removed for a good cause, a person can't be a supporter um, also. And if the supporter's ever found Crim criminally or civilly liable for any type of abuse or fraud or neglect or mistreatment, they can't be supporters either. So there are protections that are baked into the laws that do set a bar about who, who can and who can't be supporters as well. Thank you, Will. So, Let's talk a little bit about, there was an earlier reference about people can enter into a supported decision-making agreement. Um, and by the way, um, that there are many different ways that you can enter into a supported decision-making agreement. It can be simply a verbal conversation, but it's there is also a, a set, a, a section of this legislation that talks about if you have a written supported decision-making agreement, what would it look like? So here's some of the information that they have within that section. 
a supported decision making agreement means a voluntary written agreement that is written in plain language that is accessible to an adult with a disability. A supported decision making agreement may be revoked orally or in writing at any time by either party. And that's actually interesting when you, when you see that. That means that if I'm a person with a disability, I can say I don't want this person as a supporter. Also, it means that if I'm a supporter, which I am a supporter to, to, uh, to, to a person, if, at, if, if I say I'm not the right fit for this anymore, then it gives me the ability to exit. Um, and, and that's, both of those things are, are very, very important. Um, supported decision-making agreement may include images, be read aloud, or be video or audio recorded in addition to the written, to the written version. This is so important because so many people with disabilities are oftentimes kept out of, of having the past been pre prevented from signing or entering into certain contracts because they are unable to read that contract. And I always think about my grandfather who was not an educated person and that provision did not apply to him and it should not apply to people with disabilities. You don't need to be able to read and you don't need to be able to read legalese. As long as the person can some way understand this information However, that's presented that is clear and accurate, and the person can understand the concept to the reasonable level that anybody else would be held to, then they can enter into that supported decision making agreement, as well as the tools that we will talk about later. So, as I mentioned just a second ago, you can do supported decision making very, very casually. You can have a formalized supported written or uh, somehow formalized kind of a supported decision making agreement. And the one thing I have found is that for many people, formalizing supported decision making does have some advantage, uh, or at least having a more structured conversation than is typically done. Because for, when you do that, it really brings up let's discuss the strengths and challenges, the strengths that the person has, as well as the support needs that they have. Let's make sure that we define and limit the areas of support. I have known many people with disabilities who have a service coordinator, they have a teacher, they have aides, they have different people coming in, and everybody feels entitled to comment and support with air quotes, everything about that person. And if that is confusing, it is not helpful. And frankly, it sets people up, in my opinion, for abuse, because we are telling people, you need to listen to everybody. It also allows people to choose who they want as supporters. And it allows the person to say, I may want John to help me with one area, and I want my mom to help me with someone, I want my friend to help me in, 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 in a different area. So it really allows people that ability to really have control over who is supporting with what, and what areas, frankly, I don't want help with at all at this point. Um, and so it's, it's the formalization can be a real help for, for many people. By the way, that last slide you noticed didn't have the legislative seal, so that was commentary, but we're going back to legislation. Um, so one of the things that I appreciate that, again, that they thought about in legislation was that we don't want supported decision-making to be viewed as a trap. So an adult with a disability signing a supported decision-making agreement does not preclude that adult with a disability from acting independently of a supporting decision-making agreement, which simply says that, yes, I want support and I want someone to help me with this, but there are times that I may want to act completely independently, or again, 
and the agreement and act independently in it, in it uh, you know, for a time. Um, similarly, the second part of this is that a, the entering into a supported decision making agreement shall not be used as a court or any other entity as evidence of incapacity. This goes back to what Will mentioned earlier. Because we have support does not mean that we're unable to function, does not mean that we don't have thoughts and views and, and can make decisions. Um, it simply says that we are being prudent in asking for advice, for information, and for assistance in an area that, that may be difficult. Um, and I, I, I once heard Will say that he heard a presentation to where someone said that this was kind of the legislative definition of a temper tantrum. Ten, temper tantrum. I will say that, that this is completely opposite of that. People with disabilities have different ways that they will show that they may want to end a and terminate a supported decision making agreement. It may not be that the person can or or thinks the way of saying, I want to write up a contract or I want to say to write something up. So you can end a supported decision making agreement by conduct intended to communicate communi termination, including by canceling, defacing, obliterating, burning, tearing, or otherwise destroying the supported decision making agreement or by directing another in the presence of the adult with a disability to destroy the supported decision-making agreement. This is not a temper tantrum. This is recognizing that people have different ways. And sometimes, even if they could do something else, the only way they may be listened to in some situation is by burning this, this, this thing. So I really appreciate, again, that they, that, that they honor the way that people um, will end this, this agreement. Otto? This is important. An exit strategy is paramount. This provides many ways in which a disabled person can communicate their desires. Thank you. Well. Thanks, Steve. Um, so one more point before we get into the practical applications of supported decision making and other decision making tools. The legislature funded a supported decision making technical assistance program to help with the implementation of these laws. And the activities weren't defined by the legislature. Um, it's going to include things like trainings, uh, like this one. Um, include the development of standardized supported decision-making materials. Um, the program could help identify of implementation barriers. And another key component of the program is that there will be a grant-making function that will go to organizations that are interested in expanding supported decision-making across the state. Uh, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities is administering this program in collaboration with DRC um, and the Mine Institute. And you know, this is a really good thing. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Um, there are so many well-meaning laws on the books in statute, but the problem is that all too often, people either don't know about them or they're uncertain about how to implement them. And the legislature really wanted to avoid that outcome here. I mean, you can see on the bottom of the slide that there's going to be a website too, and we've provided you with the landing page or the link to where that website will live. It's not live yet, um, but it will be soon. And when it is, we're happy to roll that information out and we encourage all of you to visit it. And I'll pass things back to Steve. And just one more thing at the bottom of this, there is also an email that is provided so that if you have questions about supported decision making, uh, if you want to be notified about when that series of, of, of uh, grant uh, 
input sessions that are going to be had about how, how to spend uh, the grant and how to create the support, uh, please email uh, the SDM tab uh, uh, email that is at the bottom of that slide. Um, so we are now going to get into some practical applications of decision making, and we really, at this point, wanted to focus on three different areas of financial decisions, education decisions, and healthcare decisions. And we're providing some strategies and tools for how you can use supported decision making in each one of those. Adam. We all do this. Think about it. We consult with friends and family for many life decisions, big and small. We Google search. We scroll on social media. Why would disabled people make decisions any differently? Advice from trusted people in our inner circles is how everyone does it. S. D. M. Seems so typical, so normal, when you frame it like this. Thank you. So regarding um, services and reports to help manage money, um, we will get into some tools. And the reason we have this as a transition slide is that for many people with disabilities, obviously, Managing finances is something that is a struggle and families have oftentimes been at a loss at how to maintain uh, their involvement when a person becomes an adult in this area. And Otto, I know you have another thing on this one. As a young entrepreneur, I have an accountant and a relationship with my private banker. This is my community. They presume competence and have an understanding of my method of communication. They give me advice on how to reach my goals of financial stability. Thank you. So here are some support strategies. And uh, by the way, when I when I introduced myself, I just mentioned my work at the Mind Institute. In addition to the work at the mind, I've also supported a man with cerebral palsy for the past 28 years and have been involved using supported decision making strategies, although we didn't have that that language during that time. And so here are some of the strategies that I use with my friend. Um, uh, my friend pays most of his bills using from a primary account that he, that he that he has. And he uses mostly automatic bill payments, which really limits the amount of involvement um, that, that both of us need to pay attention uh, to, you know, throughout that just routine process. We, of course, monitor the account, but it's a very simple way for us to do that. Um, my friend um, has an account uh, for, for his earnings and I am listed on that as as a joint as as a joint person on the that account, and that allows me again to just monitor remotely what's happening with that finances. Uh, I do have in our situation, I am able to to also uh, make payments if need need be. Um, but primarily, that's not the way we handle it. But it's it's an opportunity for both a me to monitor, to make to to to, to make uh, 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 some type of intervention if I notice something that looks that looks concerning. Uh, it also gives me the ability to communicate with a bank. He's also signed a form that we'll talk again about in the few, in just a little bit where I am listed as someone who can call the bank and get information or to give information. Um, another form of support regarding finances is that regional center for many people, if they're, if they, um, when they move out of a, a family's house, 
uh, maybe uh, in independent or supported living services. And as someone who's done that work before, much of the work that we did was, again, helping people develop budgets and monitor accounts. If need be, you can also have an authorized representative who is uh, someone who, again, is able to, in different forms, uh, both at a bank level, I'm also an authorized representative to speak uh, on his insurance um, and to, to different institutions that, that he has found is helpful for me to either, again, know information or to provide information. So he's, he has used authorized representative forms to allow me to communicate uh, um, on different things. Again, also, if needed, there are formal payees that can receive and, uh, money and make payments and, and, uh, and distribute uh, money to both for expenses as well as for the person's personal spending and power of attorney, which, which, which can also be a formal structure that we will talk about uh, more in depth in just a second. So all of these are tools and strategies that, uh, that can assist families and love or, or supporters, because again, the supporter may not be a family member. I'm not a good, a, a good, a good reference there um, with, with providing information, uh, helping to understand, and if needed, at the level that my friend has chosen, I can intervene if, as, if, uh, you know, if and when needed. Oh, could I add something there, Steve? Uh, I I just remembered to um, that with the joint account, uh, it can be important to be aware that um, SSI benefits can be lost <clears throat> if a certain amount is exceeded. I, Two thousand is usually the limit. There's also the option of the Cal Able accounts, um, but it is important to know that if a um, if a professional conservator is appointed, then they, they take charge of the ABLE accounts and they are permitted by law to spend the money paying themselves their own fees. Thank you, Linda. Will? Thanks, Steve. Um, let's move on to educational decision-making. We wanted to spend some time on this topic because the education system it can be a major driver of conservatorship. And there's research that shows that special education programs often recommend that parents get conservatorship without ever discussing any other options. And you know, I can't blame parents who are seeking conservatorship in these situations. Their child is about to turn 18 or is getting closer to that age. They're told, hey, you're going to lose the right to make participate or make educational decisions. And you can only participate or make those decisions um, if you get conservatorship, not just education, other major life decisions too. Um, so I'm not sitting here saying that no one should ever get a conservatorship under any circumstance, but I am suggesting, suggesting that, you know, especially during that critical period of transition, that's a time options could be explored, alternative options. And for starters, uh, Steve talked about this a little earlier, uh, students have the right to invite supporters to their IEP meetings and be supported in those meetings. Um, I'll talk in a few slides, but students can also formally assign educational decision-making families if they want their families to continue to have that level of, I call, say, control over their educational decisions. And we're also going to spend some time talking about student IEPs. The truth is that supported decision making is not always going to work well if the first time people think about their own decision making is when they turn 18 or if they're asked to make a really big decision about their lives without being given the opportunity to practice making a bunch of smaller decisions. Decision-making, it's a skill. And like any other skill, it gets better with practice. And 
the earlier in life this practice starts, uh, the, the better the skill develops. And so this is where um, student-directed IEPs also come into play. And I, I think Otto has a few additional points as well. This will be a hard sell at first. This is a hard ask, I know. Families need to understand the significance of inclusion of their person at all levels. How can we teach opinions matter if students are never part of the process? Inclusion means more than a seat in the general education classroom. Accommodations and modifications can start in the I, E, P meetings themselves. Speaking your mind is a skill. Teach the lessons early. The education system is a great place to develop those skills. You are there for nearly two decades. Individuals with disabilities having a free public education is recent history, especially when you consider the first public school in America opened in 1635. Despite the law, disabled individuals are still denied access, but now, thankfully, have an avenue to defend their rights to education. Let's piggyback on this right to education and start with lessons of supported decision making. What could be more important, seriously? When we think about I, E, P, goals, let's think about ways to authentically teach supported decision making and thereby designing realistic goals for a person-centered plan and a self-directed life. I cannot stress enough how a robust system of communication is the cornerstone to every decision an individual makes. Knowing your communication is valued is paramount to the lessons of supported decision making. Many I, E, P, lack girls for critical thinking and decision making because there is a systemic lack of presumption of competence in our education system. We are changing the tides. Yeah. Thank you, Otto, for that. Um, Otto is exactly right. And you know, there's a whole movement in the education system. I wish it was larger, but it's starting around student-directed IEPs. So more specifically, this is where students play a lead role um, on their IEP team, and they work with team members to develop their own goals, their own objectives, their own services. And the idea is that the students' responsibilities will increase as they progress in school, but the key is to start young. For example, younger students can learn to introduce themselves and talk to their IEP teams about what they'd like to do. And as they get older, they can talk about their favorite subjects, uh, what they're interested in learning more about and what type of supports work or don't work well for them. But the ultimate goal of student-directed IEPs is for the student to start to chair the meeting um, and cooperatively develop and be supported in developing all aspects of the IEPs. And there's benefits to this. It gives students a chance to practice different decision-making skills in what is or should be a safe environment. And research shows that students who lead their IEP meetings, they gain increased self-confidence and are better able to advocate for themselves. Um, they interact more positively with adults and they assume more responsibility for themselves. Um, and they're also less likely be, to be subjected to um, abuse um, because they have to say no or learn to speak and make choices for themselves. So you know what this kind of sounds like? It sounds like supported decision-making and it is in a way. And again, the idea is that before the student has turned 18, they've already been practicing these decision-making skills all along and then ideally will continue to do so as they reach adulthood. So when they turn 16 or they turn 18 and someone says, what about supported decision-making? What about conservatorship? What's the next option for your decision-making after school, after um, the school ends? Well, they've already been talking about that throughout their educational life. Next slide. I have one more point about educational decision-making. 
sometimes uh, the student just wants their parent or their guardian to keep making those educational decisions for them. And as much as you know, I talked about student-directed IEPs and really want young adults to take charge of their own education, I also know that not everyone wants to or is ready to take that step, and that's okay too. But it doesn't require a family getting a conservatorship like some schools might suggest. All it requires is what's called an assignment of educational decision-making authority in writing. And uh, Disability Rights California and the California Courts website has sample forms. And uh, this can cover anything from you know, giving a parent or a guardian um, authorization to access educational records or attend IEP meetings um, to authorizing services or filing complaints on the student's behalf. So it can still be customized. But the point is that if this is about educational decision making, well, there are ways um, that are alternatives to conservatorship if a student wants their uh, parent or guardian to remain involved. Will, if I can interject, I just wanted to mention that this is where the entry point is for many families into conservatorship. And this is an extremely important workaround. It's such a common thing that uh, that this leads to cons that IEP rights or educational rights lead to conservatorship, that it's known as a school to conservatorship pipeline. Uh, so this is really important to know about and could <clears throat> make it so unnecessary uh, for many people to enter the court system. Okay, uh, so I think Steve's uh, letting me handle some of this medical support information. <clears throat> and uh, what we'll be covering here are tools that you can use at home and with your doctor and in the case of hospitalization. And uh, Will and Steve will go over um, many of those tools, but I, I'm just providing as an introduction that this is another entry point that's quite common is um, when a, um, a developmentally disabled person or elderly person uh, goes to the doctor for some kind of a medical treatment need and there's an issue of informed consent that um, it's not unusual for a doctor <clears throat> to um, be uncomfortable that informed consent is adequate and a doctor can fear that they would be charged criminally with assault and battery if they were to say perform surgery on a patient without uh, sufficient um, informed consent. And this is where it's not unusual, maybe where a medical provider would say to the family that they need to get a conservatorship. So this is another uh, pipeline. <clears throat> Uh, and so there's a lot of ways uh, to deal with that problem and overcome it. And uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, really well-respected physicians in the field of developmental medicine is at the UC San Francisco um, um, Medical Center, and she runs a developmental clinic there, and that's Clarissa Kripke. And she mentioned that there, that there are unintended you know, consequences to conservatorship in the medical field. What she said is that she has patients who have court appointed conservators. Um, and then I believe she's referring to professional conservators primarily, and that they've never met the person that they're supporting. They don't show up when the person is in the hospital. <clears throat> Sometimes conservators who know very little about the situation will sign off on informed consent, even without in, uh, understanding the person's priorities, uh, and even without having discussed it or having a, a much of a relationship with them. At other times when people can't be reached or re, uh, are reluctant to make a decision, people go without care because you can't get informed consent and it isn't an emergency. It can only it can delay care in ways that are very harmful. Uh, the mention of emergency is that uh, my understanding is that under an emergency situation that the law allows 
three doctors to sign off that it's an emergency and that informed consent can be overridden. I'll defer to, to Will to see if that's correct, but there's some kind of contingency there for emergency situations. Um, and uh, I would add that uh, I've talked to physicians at UCLA who have said that they um, were in a position where a, a professional non-family conservator was insisting that the doctor perform <clears throat> an elective procedure on a patient who uh, vehemently opposed it and that he was caught in that interesting dilemma <clears throat> where <clears throat> Uh, he felt it wasn't appropriate to do the procedure against the patient's wishes and it wasn't essential uh, and he finally went with with the patient uh, but i'm sure it, in other cases it doesn't always go that way um, there is importantly other things that can happen and i'm not i may sound anti-conservatorship but what i'm trying to do is let you all know where the landmines are located and what the dangers are <clears throat> And uh, one, of, one of the dangers uh, is that um, the professional conservators <clears throat> can actually uh, have, there could be fatal consequences. There was a case in Florida of a professional guardian, they call conservators guardians there, <clears throat> Rebecca Fearley. She apparently had hundreds of, pay, of people under her care. <clears throat> there they call conservatives wards. And apparently, she was um, making a lot of money uh, in this situation, but when when her wards would would run out of money, when their bank accounts would dry up, and these were often elderly, she would um, put do not resuscitate orders on on those individuals. Uh, evidently, when when the money ran out, and um, and this was even over the objections of the individual and the families. One of her charges, Mr. Stryker, objected when she ordered doctors to stop providing him food in his feeding tube. And his family also objected, and medical examiners told the guardian that Mr. Stryker was fully capable of making end-of-life medical decisions for himself, and that he under <clears throat> understood his condition and that he had a strong desire to live. The healthcare providers reluctantly followed the guardian's order and uh, the patient died a few days later. Um, the family reported this tragic event to state agencies. And uh, in July of this year, um, finally went to court and she was given probation. So very un unintended consequences can occur. And these are, of course, extreme cases, but just important for everyone to know what can happen. Uh, next slide. So some of the things that can help are um, to work together with um, the individual to make calls for scheduling appointments and asking for information. Um, the supporters can join the medical appointments in person or even online. Uh, Third, making sure the doctors and nurses talk with and listen to the patient. Very often the doctors and or more doctors than nurses, but the doctors will want to talk for efficiency, want to talk to the supporter and not the patient uh, just because they think it's going to be more efficient. Next, uh, yeah, and lastly, I think this is the last one, uh, that it's important to um, essentially be a translator and simplify the information that the doctor provides and ask the doctors for examples and choices and be there to be, a, you know, education, uh, you know, support. Um, and one other thing that came up in the Q&A questions was about medical records. Um, and I think Will is going to discuss um, advanced healthcare directives, either Steve or Will will be talking about those, but I wanted to mention that many medical centers and medical systems now have um, <clears throat> mobile apps and, and computer based apps that will allow you to designate another person to, um, to have complete access to your medical records. 
and it's just done electronically and anytime there's any lab result or anything it's communicated both to the patient and to the supporter and that's open to anybody um, not just uh, someone with disabilities so uh, that's a, a really nice new system was there one more on this slide so, oh yeah and um and it's it's also okay to tell the doctor that you may need to go home and talk about it that more time is needed or another appointment is needed to make a decision um, currently doctors tend to be under a lot of pressure to move swiftly um, but it's appropriate uh, to say we're going to need we'll need to talk about it some more and uh, make a decision later and that's fine next oh yeah and uh and lastly, I think, and Stephen will cover this, using plain language HIPAA release forms also allows you to name trusted supporters who can receive medical information. And as I mentioned, uh, there was a question um, in the Q&A on that, and I hope uh, that went to everyone. Um, but those plain language forms are very useful. There's also very important, especially during pandemic, to have a plain language medical passport tool that allows uh, the, the person with disability to prepare for an appointment and to give the doctor key information, especially when there's a AAC alternative and augmentative communication or augmentative and alternative communication that's used by the patient. So the doctor understands um, you know, the right way to approach it. This was extremely important during the pandemic when family members and supporters were initially not allowed to go in the hospital to provide support. And I can remember writing up for one of my family members a very detailed explanation about triggers and uh, ways to communicate and ways to um, what they, their comprehension of medical terminology and language uh, is all about. So these kind of passport tools that explain uh, in writing information for the healthcare providers, extremely important. Uh, and then um, the, legally uh, using a advanced health, advanced health directive, and I think there's gonna be more detail coming up. Uh, these can be written in plain language <clears throat> and a, uh, these can provide uh, anticipated problems and what to do about it. And there can be agents assigned through this healthcare directive. And it can, we all use those as part of our, uh, you know, estate plans that what to do when we're incapacitated and, or, and if the doctor questions the ability to understand or decide, then there could be someone assigned to be a healthcare agent. Um, and that's, you know, true for, um, uh, anyone and not necessarily people with disabilities. And lastly, I hope this, I don't remember what's last, <laughs> but uh, using a plain language durable power of attorney is also valuable. And I think uh, Stephen Will will talk about ways to use combinations of plain language and formal um, forms of these legal instruments. Next, and then uh, regional center authorization for medical, surgical, or dental care is another um, option, and I am not terribly familiar with that, so I might uh, ask Stephen Will to look to discuss that. But the the regional center social workers and uh, person assigned to the individual uh, can help this out, uh, help out in these cases, and uh, dentists and and uh, Doctors are not highly educated about these things, and hopefully we'll be able to get them more educated. Yeah, Next. just real briefly, um, the legislation, again, there were already formal rules about the limits that the regional center can do this. Uh, and there have been concerns for many years that the regional center would just willy-nilly make healthcare decisions for people. Um, in practice, and especially as again codified within 1663 legislation, there are very clear limits. This is last ditch if needed. There is nobody else, and there needs to be a medical decision. Um, the regional center director is able to make this in, consult in consultation with the med with the regional center's um, uh, medical director that they have. 
Great. Next. Uh, another approach when there's a informed consent is to go over the document um, at home as, as needed until they can understand the information under a less stressful situation. Uh, it's also possible then to explain the terminology well enough that the, the patient can show the doctor how well they understand. And uh, yeah, this is where the uh, going over it with the doctor, it helps the doctor see that there's sufficient uh, understanding for the, the document that's being signed. Um, so reviewing it in their presence helps. Explaining to the medical team that the advanced care directive is not just for end of life is also important that it's for any contingency uh, as noted above. And then if there are any issues that would come up, resolving them in advance uh, is extremely important. Uh, looking, at, looking ahead to what the contingencies might be. And having the document entered into the patient's medical record ensures that it's found when needed. Uh, very often the medical systems will have a mechanism to submit it online, uh, but just turning it into the doctor's office, it will usually suffice. Next. Okay. I think I'm turning it over to Will. Yes, Linda, thank you. Um, Sometimes it's good to show and not just tell. So for the next few slides, we're going to give examples of different tools that people can use to get to make medical decisions. And the tool you see in front of you is a simplified HIPAA release. So HIPAA is a law that protects patient privacy and makes sure that doctors and other healthcare providers uh, keep their health information confidential. So a decision maker can always sign a, what's called a HIPAA release form to authorize a doctor or healthcare provider to share that medical information that would otherwise be confidential and with that person's supporters. And I really like this form. It's clear, uh, it's in plain language, and it's formatted in a way that's easy to read and naturally follow along from top to bottom. And this is the type of HIPAA release form I'd like to recommend to my clients and their families. Uh, next slide. So this is what I would call a standard HIPAA release. Um, I think it's what most of you are familiar with seeing if you ever see one from a doctor's office. It looks a little bit more complex. Uh, the words it uses are more formal. There's not a natural flow of the document from either like top to bottom or, or left to right. And it can be confusing uh, to people with and without disabilities about what, what it is they're signing. Um, Steve, I, I love you and UC Davis is great, but you know, you all should consider incorporating maybe a more simplified version of this form. And that sometimes people bring their own plain language or simplified hyper form because that's what the person with a disability can understand and sign. And they're told, you have to use our official HIPAA, HIPAA form. And I say, but they're both HIPAA compliant. They both follow the federal HIPAA rules about what needs to be in a release like this. So why aren't we using the form that's more accessible to more? But sometimes you run into situations where the medical office says, well, we insist we need that form uh, for our records. I, that just happens. So I always encourage people also think about ways to make the process more accessible. For example, maybe the medical provider could help transfer the information from the simple form to the standard form if they really need that standard form for their records. Or maybe they can accept the simple form as an accommodation. Now, the point is that people should have access to information in forms that they can understand um, and this isn't something that's just nice to have. It's something that I would argue is required under the Americans with Disabilities Act or other non-discrimination laws so that people with intellectual or cognitive disabilities have the same access to decision-making supports of just like everyone else. 
Um, but I'll, I'll say I don't I don't blame families and people that you know kind of get pushed into conservatorship or other things and they run into barriers after barriers after barriers and trying to get access to different types of, of say medical or educational decision making when you know their family members or others want to be supported in those decisions. So also want to make clear that you know this this is about also fixing systems and trying to change systems that we think should be more accessible to people. And in looking at strategies or thinking about, well, if it's the simplified HIPAA form that the person can understand or sign, well, let's push our say, healthcare systems to accept those as well. If I can just add, if you're in a situation to where you bring in the simplified form and the doctor says, we need to have this more formal form, as Will said, they should translate it, but it's important to have the simplified form scanned into the record so that a future doctor upon seeing the standard one and maybe saying, well, I don't think the person had the capacity to sign this can also be directed towards the form that was actually used that, that showed capacity to sign. Yeah, Will, thank you, Steve, great point, 100% um, agree. So I want to pivot to uh, advanced healthcare directives. So as Linda said, these are decision-making tools that instruct medical providers about who the decision maker is and the scope of those decisions. So again, we're starting with a simple version of an advanced healthcare directive form. And you can see that they can do things like say, I don't need anyone to support me at all, or they can name a supporter. Or they can also be used um, as a form of what we call substituted decision making. So this is when you say that someone else can make the decision for you on your behalf and the doctor will or should listen to that person and follow their lead. Um, I also want to you know, note that advanced healthcare direct, they can be used on their own, but they can also be used as part of a supported decision making agreement. Um, let's use an example of a decision maker named Carla. So Carla wants her sister to be her supporter for her healthcare decisions. And she works with her supporter for a decision-making agreement. Carla says she wants to make her own decisions about her day-to-day -day health needs. She wants to decide which medications to take for her anxiety. She wants to choose her own psychiatrist and a psychologist to treat her and she wants to decide how often she goes to therapy. But she also says in her supported decision-making agreements that she wants her sister to, to decide if she ever needs major surgery. Now, Carla still wants her sister to listen to her concerns and talk to her about the surgery and then make the final decision. So Carla can sign a supported decision-making agreement with her sister that states all of this and then have an advanced healthcare directive that names her sister as her healthcare decision maker for a limited purpose of making decisions about her surgery. So it's not an all or nothing thing when we think about these different forms of decision making supports and often um, they, they can work hand in glove with each other. Next slide. Um, this, this slide shows a, a simplified advanced healthcare directive um, form to show that, well, advanced healthcare directives, they don't have to take effect right away. And people can choose to keep all or poor parts of their medical decision-making authority um, and say they don't want other people to make decisions for them unless they lose capacity to make decisions for themselves. And we call these springing advanced healthcare directives because they spring into effect. Again, this is a, a, a plainer language, more simplified way of making it clear who makes decisions, what they're about, and when those decisions can take effect. I want to contrast this with what we see on the next slide. This is what a much more formal version of an advanced healthcare looks like. Um, and if you see a document that looks like this and like the legal ease, like, great, you can go with that. But the truth is a lot of people aren't going to understand these forms. And the worst case scenario is that the person that's acting on this form, when the time comes to use it, when it counts, 
they might not be able to figure out what it says because the language ends up being so darn dense. So I've, I've been talking a lot about plain language and simpler language, but what I'm also talking about is universal accessibility. And I really do encourage people um, when at all times possible to use the forms that have simpler language, that have plainer language, that minimizes the risk of confusion, that makes it easier for not just the person with the disability that you're supporting to complete the form and understand it with the capacity to sign it, but I think it helps for everybody else too. Clarity is important. And Steve's going to provide a few more examples of ways to collect and share information in, in healthcare settings too. Thank you, Will. So I have to return the dig that Will made towards, uh, towards UC Davis with the fact that this form is the, uh, the, the uh, Disability Rights California form. So. <laughs> All right. Um, so one of the things that's so important is that um, we've talked about this a little bit before. Um, medical appointments are some of the most complex, stressful, um, unusual um, things that we do throughout our entire life. Um, and one of the things that's very valuable is as we're talking about helping people, you know, encouraging people and allowing people to be involved in, in appointments, it's really almost unfair to, to, to say that people should do that unless they have tools uh, and, uh, that we can provide to do that. And I just want to start off with the fact that, so at, at UC Davis, one of the roles that I have is I, I'm involved in what they call a transition clinic where we meet with people in transition age or adults or young adults. Um, and and one of the, we provide uh, tools. And one of the things that was interesting was that initially there was a very strong uh, push that we would only provide people with one form of a tool that was heavy on graphics. And, and choice is important in everything we do. And we have to recognize that some people like forms and resources that have graphics and very simplified language. And there are other people that look at forms that have graphics and, and language, and they, they are reluctant to use them because it makes them, them feel childish. And sometimes they're worried that if they submit that form to a medical provider, that they will, that that will amplify the view that this person does not have capacity and does not have the ability to, to participate in the decisions. And so it's important that we think about the fact that we need to look at, um, uh, at, at the types of forms and offer choices. And, and so in the resources that I have, I, I have both, si both styles and I'll show examples real quick. But it's really important that we respect the choice and respect the preference of the person and we provide resources in different formats. This is a format that has very important information about my current medications, how I take medications, what I'm allergic to, how I show pain, how I get, if, I'm, if I get upset or distressed, these are the ways that you can assist me. And this is what that actually means also. This is all very important information, but you see that this information is in a very graphic, heavy, could be conceived by some people as childish information. I'm not at all discouraging this. Many people like this format and I fully respect people who do. On the other side, this is a similar kind of document um, uh, th through Thriving Autistic Health that um, has I, much of that same information. This is how I experience pain. This is how I communicate pain. And this is how you can ask me about my pain. It's written in a very text heavy kind of format. Again, some people will prefer one version or other, and we should make sure that we provide both sets so, so that people can make the appropriate choice for them. Um, well, I think you're going to, to take this one. And thanks, Steve. So as we move to wrapping this presentation up, just want to offer a framework for how to choose the right decision-making tools. 
these are an all or nothing things. It's not just power of attorney or just supported decision making or just conservatorship. Um, there's really no one size fits all approach uh, to approaching how we find the right decision making tools. So you want to think about you know the area of the person's life where there's a need for support and the right tool to meet that need. And it could be things that we've been talking about today, um, like decisions in healthcare, uh, financial decisions or educational decisions. There might be other things as well around independent living, um, but we wanna be targeted um, because there's no one size fits all approach. So one question to ask is how much risk is involved? You know, some decisions are really big and they're really risky um, and others are less than so. Let's take educational decisions, for example. And they're really important decisions, right? But let's be honest, they're usually not life or death, usually. So this could be a good area um, in which to introduce supported decision-making principles in a person's life. It's like what Otto was saying, start early. But also ask things like, how hard would it be to undo the decision? Has the person ever made this decision before? How likely is the decision to be challenged? Decision making, it's a skill, and sometimes that skill set starts later in life, but you can't always expect someone who's never been given a meaningful role in decision making to all of a sudden just know what to do or even feel comfortable making those decisions. So this is a situation where maybe someone wants someone else to make the decision for them, like Carla in the example we gave. Um, she wanted to, she wanted to use an advanced health to her sister decision making rights over surgery. But she wanted to keep her own decision making um, rights over her other health care to herself. And I know there are real understandable fears um, in times of crisis, for example, where someone goes to a doctor that might not honor a decision made through support decision making. And there are just there aren't a lot of good options in the moment if you disagree with something a doctor's saying. So I have some clients that want the comfort of knowing there are other decision-making tools available if necessary to use that in that moment. So for example, this is where some people have a substituted decision-making maker agreement, like through an advanced healthcare directive, in their back pocket, you know, as a backup for significant medical decisions in the event they run into friction um, at the doctor's office around using supported decision-making. So again, it's not all or nothing and people kind of target and choose the, the framework that works for them. So just in, in other words, we ask, what's the least restrictive support or combination supports that might work? And then to use the right tool um, for the right decision at the right moment in time. Otto. I just want to take a minute to thank the organizers and the audience for their patience and attention to detail. I would be remiss if I didn't answer the question on everyone's mind. How can we support Otto's mission on inclusion, equity, information sharing, and inspiration giving? It is easy. Check out my website www.ottosmodos.com Buy my stuff, but only if you like it. Follow me on Instagram at Otto underscore Tulps. That's O-T-T-O underscore T-Y-P-E-S. There will be a lot of information about supported decision making, especially the next 18 months as my friends and I launch our informational campaign as state ambassadors for Center for Youth Voice, Youth Choice. Otto's Mottos is a for-profit entity, but just so you know, my profits are donated to non-profit entities supporting those with speech-related disabilities, such as Disability Voices United, Disability Rights California, Communication First, and many others. Thank you again. Consider yourselves all citizens of my utopia, Otter Nation.
Thank you, Otto. We are going to get to questions, but real quick before we do, I just want to show uh, Linda, uh, who uh, one of our presenters um, um, helped produce this amazing video, which is something that is, um, I, if, if you look, I have my first resource page is resources that you can provide to medical providers. And that video, as well as these other resources, are, are resources that I encourage you to sort through to see which ones may be the most helpful for you to educate and support your medical provider with seeing and, and understanding how to best support you and the person uh, that you may be supporting. Uh, in addition to this page, I also have a full page of resources about different forms of health passports that are very helpful for you to do. And I want to note that some are for medical appointments and there is also one for hospitalization. Um, and those, are, both of those are equally important. Uh, if you have an upcoming hospitalization, um, ha giving a, a, a document to that staff to know not to uh, how to understand you, how you communicate, how you express pain, how they can support you best is very, very important. And then I've got this entirely large um, of resource at the very end, uh, which is filled with, with more resources than, than um, most people will ever have the time to look at. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and open up for opportunity for, for questions. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. Uh, just Otto, Linda, Will, and Steve, the information, and again, with me having two children um, that are younger, so many things to think about and so much information. I know we have questions. Um, while we're answering the questions, I'm going to go ahead and just launch a, a quick poll. Um, we're going to answer questions as we go. If you could go ahead and fill out the poll for us, it helps us understand if this was uh, useful for you and how we could change things in the future, and as well as continuing to provide things for you. We're also going to have a full transcription of this in Spanish and a couple other languages. I apologize, there were some issues with a Zoom update today. Um, so in the questions, let's see what we have. Um, we start off with the very first one. Linda's typing an answer to one right now. So we'll go ahead and I'm gonna start really quick. Um, let's see. So that what are the names of the mobile apps for the healthcare directives? Steve, are those in those resources that you have that we're going to be sending yeah. out? Uh, well, so different systems, uh, different health systems have different apps that are associated to them, but the advanced care directives uh, and all those things are in the, the that second set of resources. Um, and I believe it's also in the first one for the medical providers as well. Perfect. Uh, let's see. For example, UCLA has an app called MyChart. It's, I mean, that may be used by other health systems as well. But I think that's quite common now. That's where, how people make appointments and, and get lab results and communicate with their doctors. Um, so I think that's going to be very common. And those apps allow designation of a supporter without any special legal process. Absolutely. And Linda, I did see that you're typing um, an answer to Karen's very first question about, I think it gets out, what do we do? What do we do in cases of abuse? Um, I'm happy to start. You know, feel free to add. Yeah, I wanted to defer. I was writing that I was going to defer to Will as far as legal ways to protect. I can say that what I've seen is that family members usually try to get help in court. And if they don't have funds for an attorney, they try to represent themselves, what you call pro se. Um, but I'm not aware of any successes with those approaches. Um, although the Jenny Hatch, Jonathan Martinez story might relate tangentially and be of interest. Um, uh, so there are families that have considered and even tried uh, more desperate measures, but I wouldn't want to get into that. I, I have a Thanks for that, Linda. I have a, a bit of a broader point around um, cases of abuse because we see so often that if someone, 
sometimes conservatorship happens as a protective measure because there's a person over here that we think is sketchy or maybe you know abusing or taking advantage of a person with a disability so we need to get a conservatorship to protect that person but i the way i i'd like to flip that narrative a little bit um, and just ask in cases of abuse or if something bad is going on we should be going after the bad guys um Restraining orders. If a family doesn't have the the ability to pay, there are legal aid organizations that can help. But the why why do we revert to often taking away someone's rights to protect them because there's someone else out there doing bad things? That's we need to focus more on going after the bad guys. I know sometimes that's easier said than done, but it is an option that may be a little bit harder. Um, but it shouldn't be easier to take someone's rights away to protect them from someone else than it is to go after the the bad person. I, I think a, a question that is very important to answer is Nancy's about um, how to support a decision making apply to individuals who are nonverbal and intellectually challenged. Mm -hmm. And Will, do you want to start with that? Um, I'll start with going back to some of the things I was talking about, for example, the HIPAA releases. Um, you put a complex HIPAA release or any complex form in front of somebody, you know, whether they have an intellectual disability or they don't have a disability, it's going to be hard to understand those forms and have the capacity to enter into those agreements. So we think about how do we make forms, how we make it accessible to people. I want to go back to something that Otto said. Um, how do students make IEP decisions for themselves if they're not being supported in communication access? So even asking those questions around how can someone get supported to communicate with the world around them, which is a pretty fundamental right. Um, and let's use that also before we think about, are they nonverbal? Can they communicate? What's it even mean to be nonverbal? Are there other forms or ways in which people can communicate? So it's a really real, it's a real concern. Um, but I just, you know, encourage people to take a step back and look around, whether it's through schools or regional centers and really push the concept of what kind of communication works best for this person so that they can have the capacity and support to enter into things like a support decision-making agreement. So it's not all or nothing thing. And Steve, Otto, you may have other um, points to add on this as well. I, I, I think it's important, first of all, to recognize that 1663 does have, you know, language that talks about the fact that, you know, there are many ways that people communicate and express themselves and that those those should be recognized as 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 communication. Um, I will say that historically, people who talk different, who who even people with cerebral palsy who just have a slur um, are oftentimes viewed as not having capacity and um, and the the ability, again, is not dependent on the person's ability to be able to read information or to take it in a formal way. As long as you can explain information simplified using whatever graphics, whatever kind of examples, and that person has a general understanding and, and understands it to the point that they can say, I want this, I don't want this, or I want support with this area. Uh, that should be that should be recognized and honored. Um, I will say I think that currently there there is a there is a very fuzzy cutoff where support decision making may not be currently recognized, and th that would be someone who again clearly is is unable to in any way express. Um, any type of of response to information that's given to them. I think at that point, our current process does not allow supported decision making to go within that. We have a question in here too. Otto, would you mind sharing your website and Instagram account in the chat for us? That'd be fantastic. And let's see what else we have. We've got some great stuff. Um, do you know of resources available or incentives around these types of supported decision making tools slash forms that could be used in example um, during case management or with regional center social workers um, or in service delivery? So 
the educational decision form and the form saying um, the authorized representative forms, all of those things are things that apply equally to regional center. And frankly, we, we've talked about the school to conservatorship pipeline, the medical uh, to conservatorship pipeline, regional center, frankly, has its own because so many families are worried that they're getting steamrolled uh, or not uh, included in those kinds of things. Again, it's dependent on the person inviting you and being and wanting your input. But most people, there are very few situations that I have ever witnessed where people are saying, I do not want anyone to support me. So, yeah. I, I want to also just emphasize um, that technical assistant project that's going to be rolling out we there will be i encourage people to sign up to that uh that email address with the state council that was that was on one of our very early slides uh, because uh we will be uh you will be able to get information about the grant process to start with about what kind of technical assistance kind of projects we will be uh establishing throughout California, as well as eventually how you can link to those technical assistance projects, because we recognize that families will need to be supported as they implement this. They will need to be supported. You will have questions, you will encounter barriers, and we want you to, to have support. And again, I just also want to emphasize, we will also be working with courts, doctors, regional centers, uh, a number of different kinds of areas to make sure that there is a shift in the paradigm in welcoming the support that people are asking for. I think one of the, uh, it's such an interesting uh, point because we have someone in here that had talked about, you know, there's, servicing a group of Chinese speaking parents and young adults with developmental disabilities. And the issue is, is that their siblings might not want to take care of them when, you know, things get, you know, life happens. Um, and that's something I struggle with on a day to day basis of what's going to happen when I'm gone and what happens if, you know, something happens where I don't have anyone else. Um, and I think that these options that have been presented, again, which kind of answers the other question in there, which is, th is this meant to be an option instead of doing conservatorship? It's about presenting options. Um, the amount of information that these panelists have presented to the group is substantial. And it gives parents and young people the opportunity to weigh out what it is that's needed for them. I, you know, every family is different. Every family has different situations and I would never push someone one way or the other. And I don't believe anyone on this panel would because you have to make your own decision, but you can't do that unless you have the information. And that's why I'm so excited that they were, be able, they were able to provide so much and all this is going to be sent to you. You'll be able to review it with your children, with caretakers, see what works for you. There's already things that I'm going to implement in here um, <laughs> that I didn't know about and I do it for a living. So it, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and I, I just, I really, really appreciate it. So anyone, hand, I just want to see if anyone's hand is up really quick. Great questions. Yes, Great. fantastic questions. I don't see anyone's hands up. And Otto, did you put your, let's see. He did. All right. Otto raised his hand. Go ahead, Otto. Otto also, I'm Shelly, I'm his communication partner. Otto also types on a um, waterproof letter board and that's his easiest way of communicating. It's it's much more arduous and, and takes a lot more time to do it on the Bluetooth keyboard and then make sure that there's no typos and, and everything in, in the um, iPad and the Proloquo for text. So while he was watching the questions about um, what about non-speaking, non-verbal um, family members, he typed, this was a catastrophe that happened during the pandemic where children were at home or young adults or, or whoever were at home 
And the families had no idea how to communicate, how to support communication in the home because they relied on speech therapists, occupational therapists, paraprofessionals. So when they got home and found themselves at home, they had no system of communication. So this was a huge catastrophe for people. And this is what scared people into thinking, I need to be a conservator because I need to make decisions because my person, my human can't make decisions on their own. Um, and he said, non-speaking does not mean non-thinking. And this was a wake up call that family members and friends and trusted support need to learn how to support individuals who use AAC. And another thing that happened was many of the schools didn't allow for the assistive technology or for the AAC devices to go home with the individuals. So again, families were left with no support in terms of technology or even the um, expertise on how to support their non-speaking person. So he just said that that's a wake up call that communication is the most vital thing to any decision and communication has to happen first and every day and all day, not just when it's medical decisions, not when it's living decisions, not when they turn 18. If I can just say one, I know we're just over time, but if I can just one last thing for me um, is the fact that in the work that I have done with families uh, who are have kids still in school, um, many schools are not, do not have show and, and provide the full array of communication options. And if you do not think that your child is, is, is being given the appropriate communication supports, as Otto said, there is nothing more important. I, I was just meeting with a family yesterday that their son is, is getting near graduation. And my thing is nothing else matters right now other than communication. Um, and, and so my encouragement is to push if you don't think, if, if, if they are not providing the full array and you think that there is more communication, make that top priority. Nothing else on the IEP matters until you've got the communication, in my opinion. 